very curious. There, there, there. She followed him and soon found herself falling in a very deep hole into a strange place called Curious. Conversation. Curious. Conversation. Nowadays there are still... Hello all. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, and first of all, I really just want to do the really basics of allowing each person to introduce themselves, share who you are and where you're from and just what the women's work you do do. And maybe that's just the label or what to the specifics. If you want to go around, Yana, if you would like to start. Hello, hello. My name is Yana. Um, from the UK, I live in South Africa, and I am an artist and I'm an emotional clearing practitioner. So lots of transformation work, lots of diving in deep, lots of expression stuff, bringing ourselves into our bodies as much as possible and really calling ourselves home in the way that we interact with what's going on inside. Mm. I am the leader you could say of a, a sisterhood called deep inner knowing which started out as an online course and has now become a group of 60 women online journeying the work together for the long run always welcoming in more women and more women and more women and so it's yeah it's a really beautiful example of what sisterhood can be and so integral to the way that i live life and journey and mm. yeah dive into what women's work even means. Mm. Mm. I like that. What women's, women's work means. Cause I want to unpack that later. Thank you, Yana. Uh, Leah, would you like to share? Sure. I'm Leah Steele. I'm from America and I live in Bali, Indonesia. And I am a wealth consciousness coach and a spiritual business mentor. Mm. Um, and I work primarily with women helping to empower them to deconstruct their wealth programming mm. um, and repattern that programming so that they can live lives that are empowered and enriched with all of the resources that are their divine birthright that I believe that they're here to embrace and achieve. Mm. Um, and yeah, so I primarily work with women wanting to be wildly financially abundant, doing their purpose work in the world. Mm, huge. Fuck yes. Thank you. And Six. Yeah. So I'm Sigourney, Sigourney Bell. And I am the director and founder of the Wild Grace Movement, mm. which is a movement that's existed for about two to three years that um, is basically teaching women how to access their creative gifts and, and powers and, and uh, their like, innate genius through their body. So through liberating them through, um, through a system that helps them to access and ignite their feminine power. Mm. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the Wild Grace Movement. I also am a spiritual business mentor and work with women in startups. Mm. Um, so I have a... Uh, it's like a group which is called the doctorate which is particularly aimed at um, helping women to anchor into their like particular um, business entity so creative entity and um, it's quite I guess an unconventional way of doing business and I'm really focused on women that are kind of creating business entities that are quite unconventional and taboo mm. Um, mm. yeah wonderful thank you uh, where I want to go first is the idea of, of women's work and it's like path into it, especially beforehand. I was talking to one of my friends about you, Leah being in here and they're like, Oh, Leah's a women's work person. I never, and I could see the cogs ticking in their brain. Like, Oh, like, yeah, I guess. And I'm wondering if like you one have ever labeled yourself that or two, like, came into it being like, oh, I'm going to be a women's work coach or wealth, which wealth alchemist. Yeah. I mean, so it's only been in the last, I would say 18 months that I've really been being much more inclusive and working with more men. Mm. Um, originally I only worked with women. Mm. Um, and that was quite clear in my marketing and in my promotion. 
Um, and I think it's because when I originally came into this business and I, and I originally stepped into coaching women, um, it was because I wanted to create safe spaces, safe spaces for women to explore their individual spirituality. I felt like that was really lacking in the world Mm -hmm. and that there was a lot of judgment and shame around women wanting to step into their own unique spirituality. And so that's how I began my journey Mm -hmm. and it evolved from there. Um, so I would say, you know, 98% of my clients are women Mm. and I continue to just see women showing up in my life. And as a spiritual business mentor, I work exclusively with women. Oh, okay. It's good to know. Yeah. Like all from, from my understanding, it was maybe last year's Ouroboros where you first opened up to men. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, so I have done work with men occasionally. There's always been a few men in my field that would reach out and say, Hey, can I join this course? I know it's always going to be women in there. Yeah. Like you. (laughs) And for me, it was never about being exclusive. It was just more about the work that I did and that I do resonates. I feel like more deeply with women (laughs) and (laughs) Um, I do see more and more men starting to really want to step into that piece that's more uh, that wealth consciousness piece that's less um, statistics and numbers and more of um, the mindset and deconditioning, essentially. Um, So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it's a word that you threw in there of being like inclusive and you didn't want to be exclusive. Um, something that I really see with your work, Yana, um, is the inclusivity of people of color. Like I see in a deep inner knowing that there's a variety of women of different nationalities and cultures. And I know myself, like as a white male, like if I look at my events, if I look at my programs, I struggle to get people of color in it's not like i'm trying like consciously trying to be exclusive but it just happens that you know and i get people of color or or queer or any kind of minorities they do come but not there's the percentage isn't as wide and i see that you've got a pretty good balance i'm i'm curious to know how you facilitated that space to be able to I don't know, I guess resonate with women of color. Do you think there was any consciousness around it? Like that's something you specifically started to create or it just naturally happened? I think it just naturally happened. And I think that it has a lot to do with my upbringing. I grew up around a lot of people of color, my community. If I, if I think community, mm. the main reference points that I have mm. are like spaces of diversity that's Mm. that's like what the definition of community means you know Mm. like all of my reference points all of the communities that I have the strongest ones the Mm. ones that are really at the core of me and how I was raised and how I live my life and how I interact with the world are yeah very very based on diversity and so it was never really an intentional thing Mm. I also do make a point to be willing to meet the conversations Mm, mm. and I open myself up to being challenged or being questioned and Mm. I open myself up you know for example once once or twice I've been challenged on things that I've said and I've hopped into a conversation and like there's been times where the confrontation and and the charge and the trigger like the both of us on this call to hash things out were trembling Mm. like there was Mm. so much charge but I was willing to meet that conversation and I was willing to stay until there was a resolve Mm. And, and I think it's, yeah, just being willing to take care of things that are beyond my perception, beyond my insight, you know, and, and really, yeah, just really like being open to that. I think one of the things that, that I like to, to lead with is a policy of we're human first. Mm. And so mm. if anything comes up, it's like, okay, where is the human and what's moving and how do we, how do we interact with this outside of the labels and the roles and the positions that we're giving each other? And that mm. makes for vulnerability and it makes for an honesty. Mm. Mm. And um, yeah, I think that, I think that the biggest thing is like, well, I have friends that are people of color and we have conversations about these things. And because I have conversations with them about these things, then they see my offerings and 
they want to mm-hmm. jump in. I, I think it starts with just cultivating relationships outside of work mm-hmm. that are mm-hmm. with people of color that are diverse. Yeah. And then it yeah. rolls out from there. Yeah, that's a that's a I guess something that I'm currently sitting in, you know, especially with all that's going on in the world right now, more than ever it's present to to figure out and yeah, it just outside of I I like that to not be going straight for the um the market or the like the sale, you know, it's like I don't want to just get people of color, minorities, queers, whatever, like into my work. Of course I do, but it's like the first step is community. And I guess that's what I love about the three of you. You have such a unique community. Like if I go into any Leah Steele live videos, every time there's all these hashtag replays from everyone. And I feel like Leah started this hashtag replay trend. I don't know for where it was beforehand, <laughs> but I definitely seen it first in and Leah's and, and like the deep inner knowing, knowing that for instance, like I thought it was so beautiful to see women that you work with came to your wedding, you know, from all across the world. And mm-hmm. I got to experience it at the spiral prac training of like you, you all came together and, and did a healing on someone at when we were in Byron Bay and sung together. I was like, Oh wow. You know? And, and it was like, everyone was a leader and that's what I can see you're doing like very specifically. Um, Sigs is like doing this wild grace training, but there's, uh, there's practice practitioner training and, and creating a community that also creates leaders. And I know everyone is doing it, but there's a specific that's like, here's this thing, a modality that you can go and teach. I'm, I'm curious to hear how the politics goes for that with you, as in like from someone, from you being a leader to like raising leaders and is there like any kind of like confrontation once it's like, uh, now I'm also a leader just like you. It, how How mm. is that journey for you from like community where you're leading to equal leaders? That's a really good question. Thank you. And it's something that I'm always expanding on with my awareness. Mm. Um, and it can be challenging at times actually. Mm. Um, but yeah, so one of the things that I find particularly um that I've like bought into the wild, wild grace movement and something that I, I stand by so strongly is that um, I am committed to everyone's individual sovereign truth in a space. And I'm committed to um, raising them into that space. And I'm also committed to them finding their individual um, unique form of power, whatever that looks like, mm. you know, it's going to be so different for everyone. And, and really for me is like what I define as equality is actually not saying, Hey, like, yes, we're equal, but actually finding that space where we feel equal to one another because we're both tapped into that unique is free and, and, and our community ecosystem um, whereby we're actually encouraging um, one another to challenge one another into that mm. and um, a space where, like, all of that's completely welcome and we do a lot of like reflection work Mm. within our spaces like dark and light reflections to really help people see one another so deeply Mm. um and it has like i've been challenged challenged a lot when people have actually come into their you know into their power and um it's it's a really beautiful (laughs) experience actually like i've had people um, you know, that have been training with me and then and, and go and leave and create their own thing. And it's like, that can be really deeply triggering for me sometimes. And it's also beautiful. And it's like what I'm committed to. Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. actually, like, um, there's nothing more rewarding in mm-hmm. my experience. Mm-hmm. Um, nothing more rewarding, because ultimately, I found it's like, you know, uh, it breaks at some point, those control structures, like, if mm-hmm. you if you you're having these control structures over people at some point, they're going to break. Mm. Um, anyway, like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's like my journey has been like facilitating through deep listening, like where we can find these threads of empowerment and actually like help people to step into that, no matter how that looks. Like mm. maybe that's, that someone's working underneath me. Maybe that's me freeing them completely to be, 
have nothing to do with my business actually, you know, mm, and like mm, mm. maybe they're going to be my competitor um, and just like really stepping into a space where I can like, um, yeah, honor that process and honor who they are and um, what they're here to be doing and, and mm, mm. facilitate that actually. So Amazing. Yeah, that's, that, question, that, that, that but... definitely does. And I feel like there's a, a summary of it that Yana has a quote that I've heard you say. Um, and I, I have, I use it, but I don't know the exact wording, but it's something like, um, is your message valuable enough that, that you could honor it if someone else took it further than you? Something like that. Mm. What's, I, I don't know if you know the quote I'm talking about. Um, I, yeah, I often, for me, it's, it's a process of checking in on myself. I ask if this, if this work had to rise, but in the hands of others, mm. and if my name could have nothing to do with it, would I still cheer for it when I see it rising? Mm. Mm. And if the answer is no, then I'm, I'm off somewhere and mm. I need to bring myself back because it's, it's not about me. It's about me being in devotion and in service to the work. And so, mm. Mm. yeah, really like, re I also really feel into, I often use, um, the quote, I'm rooting for your rise, mm, like, mm. oh, we're rooting for your rise. This idea that as I deepen into myself, it gives mm. permission and it gives space for others to really blossom and come into their fullness. Mm, and that mm. the deeper that I go into inquiring about myself and, and dealing with all of the things that might be in the way mm. um, for other people rising, all the little mechanisms inside of me that might want to pull someone down, mm, like, mm. don't get above me or don't take something from me or I don't want to see you successful really just like mm. any of that that's inside of me rooting into that and like really grounding deeper for mm. their success and for, mm. for the sincerity in that yeah I, I yeah. know at the moment you're doing a, a a sort of a course clearing thing on the other woman and I, I'm curious about that to dive into it but only from my perception Leah I I believe you someone that doesn't get triggered by other people in that manner of like someone else's success. I, I, I might be wrong, but this is my perception. I'm curious to ask, do you come up against the other woman sort of wound? Well, I think I've come up against the other woman wound in many, many ways throughout yeah. my life okay. um, that have led me to be where I am today. Mm. Um, but as far as in a business sense, mm. um, you know, no, I teach a lot on crab bucket mentality and, you know, moving out of that, always wanting to hold each other down. Um, mm -hmm. And so a lot of the work that I do with women is about empowerment and is about, you know, the things that, that Yana was, was speaking about, which is, you know, when we elevate each other, we all rise. Mm -hmm. um, it's not mm -hmm. about holding each other down, though I feel mm -hmm. that that is very, um, you know, and I don't think that's our nature as humans, but I do believe that we've been programmed and conditioned to become that way, mm. um, to compete with each other in that way. So, you know, I, I think I would like to think that I am a person that celebrates other women's victories. Mm. And I would be lying if I said that I don't occasionally have those moments where I'm like, oh, mm why does she have that? Or, Oh, why is she getting that? Like, I want that. But for me, always when that happens, it's such a beautiful opportunity to ask myself, am I capable of that thing? The answer is always yes. And once I confirm that to myself, that feeling of like that jealousy or the envy or the, you know, whatever the energetic charge around is that person accomplishing the thing that I want to accomplish Mm. Once I step back into my own power, then I'm free to celebrate that person. But mm. do I have those moments? Yeah, I think everybody has those moments. Mm. Cool. I'll just take you off that pedestal now and let you hang out with us. Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, obviously, this might be a, a great question for you, Yana, because you're actually unpacking this. But I, I believe it, it mostly ties into women's work is do you think the other woman wound, especially in this like women's work comes from like women previously having been oppressed and being a minority in certain business spaces? Do you feel like that is maybe the bigger crux of it? 
I think it can be. I think it definitely contributes. For me, the biggest two questions that like run this wound Mm. are how safe is it for me to express my love or my celebration of this person? Mm. And how how deeply will I do I feel I will be received by this person? Mm. So Mm. there's 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 wanting to express love and wanting to support our essence. I feel like that's a a really natural state for us. Mm. But then if suddenly it's not going to be received, if suddenly I cheer for this person, but they're not going to hear me or they're going to shut me out or they're going to reject me or they're not going to see me in my expression of that towards them, Mm. it creates like a a fracture in the relationship. Mm. Mm, and even mm. if it's imaginary relationships and there's no actual connection there, mm. I feel like it's, it's that separation wound being activated between us and another woman. And I think that there's a lot to do with like wanting at the essence of it, wanting to return to the body, wanting to return to the womb, wanting to return into like a really intimate space with the mother, like mm, mm. through women. I think, I think that's a big part of sisterhood. And so anything that says like you won't be received by this person and it's therefore not safe to express your love for this person or your cheer for this person sends us in the opposite direction. And it's like, oh, I don't like that. Mm. So I also flip like speaking back to what I was um, sharing before. I also flip it if I see someone. So I ask about my work and like if I had to step out. But I also question if I see someone else successful, I question how would I actually cheer for this if I was part of it? And Mm. is there a match there as well? So, Mm. Mm. yeah, I feel like it's this this separation that really causes an activation of that wound. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Yeah. So so part of my um, dark drip container, it's really beautiful because um, what's interesting is before I like created this container, um, and then started doing like I have to do a session or I do a session with the women before they enter the container into really anchoring in their, their business medicine. And um, what I noticed was the women coming to me had all had visions of something I had had a vision for. And it was like this gifting of like something I had seen to them and downloading it to them. And then me being able to actually see how them holding point for a vision that potentially I wasn't able to was impacting like they're another version of me basically able to spread the work that I desire to do and spread it further in a way that I couldn't possibly at this time, if I'm holding, you know, this vision. And so what we've created in the group is like almost like this gifting economy for like for visions Mm. and like, you know, I've gifted logos and we, and we gift things and we see actually, actually how um, in doing so we're actually able to leverage what it is that we're creating um, Mm. Mm. through our work. Mm. Um, yeah, I just felt to share that. So it's like a sort of more Aquarian approach to the community. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. And I guess like on the theme of, of the other woman and and in women's work, collaboration, like collaborative projects. Like I see um, right now, Leah, I don't know if it's already been and gone, but I saw some really beautiful photos of you and that lady, the earth Oracle is a name, Michelle. And Mm -hmm. it's, it's looked like this was a really big offering that you two had to go together. Can you talk about one, how that came to um, fruition and, and to some of maybe the challenges that you've found in, in a collaboration such as this, if there is any challenges. Yeah. So, I mean, I think early on in my business, I, um, I'm a networker at heart. I'm a connector of people at heart and I Mm. love collaboration, Mm. um, just by nature. Mm. Um, I tend to do, I mean, I do my business a lot, a lot of it on my own. And so I really always am welcoming opportunities to share that burden or to share the burden sounds like maybe the wrong word, but to not have to always show up and yeah, responsibility to not always have to, to be the boss, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I, I am always welcoming collaborations for that reason. Um, I struggled early on in my career um, and certainly in this business with having collab, ha- doing collaboration with people that were not at my level. Mm-hmm. And as a result of that, there was a lack of integrity in the offering and 
um, it cause could cause strain in the relationship. Mm. And so after a little while, I just stopped doing them because it just wasn't feeling well, good to me. Mm. Um, and then Michelle Patrick, who you mentioned, um, we came together and in fact, you know, she's a deep inner woman, a deep inner knowing woman. Mm. Um, oh. and so I met her sort of through the whole spiral world mm. and in meeting her just really found somebody that I felt for the first time we were really meeting each other as equals. Um, and not that it was the first woman that I met that way, but it was the first woman that wanted to come together in collaboration with me mm. where our gifts are very different. Mm. Um, but there is a true sisterhood and peer to peer relationship there. And mm. so, yes, we have, um, done some offerings together, but we have both basically built, I've built an entire branch of my business and she has built an entire branch of her business where we now are in collaboration, um, mm. and will continue to be because it just, it's been a really beautiful working relationship. Um, that's very supportive of both of us. Um, and it's, I think because our gifts and talents are so uniquely different, mm. um, we come together to sort of make this a whole person, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. So it's, it's been beautiful and, and I have had no challenges in that, in that relationship. And, you know, that's been going on for quite a while now. And we have two really, really big offers and we've developed an emotional resonance clearing modality together that's getting ready to launch its practitioner training. And so no challenges so far and nothing but amazingness, but that has been the key for me is finding somebody that um, energetically could meet me mm. and intellectually could meet me. Mm. And um, yeah, so, and then mm. having that uniqueness, I think was, it was a really big part of it. Yeah. Huge. And congratulations. Okay. Um, the, I guess I want to maybe unpack a bit of the, the word like on my level. So what does that mean to you specifically? So I think when I'm, when I'm talking about it in that way, often what was happening is people were coming in and wanting to do collaborations with me but their networks or their communities or their experience mm. wasn't as great mm. like in numbers or in time as mine. Mm. Um, and so there was a different level of ability to show up mm. um, and one energetically hold the container. Mm. Um, that for me is something that, um, you know, even I've done collaboration with Yana um, as well and that is a really beautiful thing to have uh, the ability to have collaboration when somebody can energetically hold the container the same way that you can and mm -hmm. um, that was one of my favorite things about working with Yana um, mm -hmm. because it's rare it's rare for me to find somebody that can come into a container and hold it to the same ability as me. And I think that like when you have those imbalances, so when I say like at my level, mm. um, you know, it's not, it's not that I'm superior. It's mm. just that mm. I have a certain set of skills that allow me to do what I do very well. Mm. Um, mm. And when I go into collaboration with people, like they have to be able to bring that similar, uh, they have to have a similar skill set when it comes to, to, things like holding energetic containers, things like, you know, and then I think also when somebody comes in and their community is not as big as yours, you hope that there's a different exchange, like they're bringing something, you're bringing something. Mm, mm. Um, and those were the places that I struggled early on. Mm. Um, and, and honestly, it was as much my fault because I hadn't identified at that point that that was something that I needed. And so I had to have those experiences to say, Hey, this is really what I'm looking for. Like, I really want this in a co-facilitator. I really want someone who shows up like this. I really want, I want to feel energetically held and met inside the container as well. So. Mm, mm. Yeah. Huge. And yeah, that's so important for me. And it's, it's figuring out, you know, that, that the line of like actually being met versus like superiority, you know, like something 
that I can like do sometimes and maybe it is right. Maybe it's wrong, but it's like to collaborate with someone. It's like one of the things to check off is like, have you been through the spiral, you know? And it's like, but it's, uh, am, am I being narrow minded by going, but what about all these other things that are out there? And if I just automatically go, Oh, this person hasn't done the spiral. What about everything else that they have done? Is that me being superior? Is that being me naive, you know, but, it's i guess up to our own selves and figuring that out as we go and it sounds like you've figured out the level that best resonates with you and it's great that you have an ongoing collaboration because i think that's one of the harder things is to have obviously we've all had our collaborations and and they come and go which is also equally great just like partnerships with people but and friends and blah but to have something ongoing i think that's like really shows the work that you've put in and, and, and understanding what that is to show up on your level. Well, I think um, one of the things that you said about, you know, and I definitely have been the spiral snob at certain times during my <laughs> life as well, where I'm like, I'm not working with these people if they haven't been through the spiral. But I think what we really truly mean there is, is that what do we find in the majority of people who have been through the spiral? Radical mm-hmm. self-responsibility and accountability. Mm-hmm. So that to me is the piece, right? So mm-hmm. you don't necessarily have to have been through the spiral to have mm-hmm. radical self-responsibility and accountability, mm-hmm. but finding people with that quality and the ability to really look at themselves and to, you know, take full ownership for themselves and their actions, it's mm. quite rare in mm. the world. And so I think that's why those of us that have, you know, worked within that modality, it's an easy, it's easy for us to just be like, ah, oh, if you've been through the spiral, I'll work with you because I know that you have that to some degree. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And like, it sounds like there's like a big piece of like integrity in that, you know, like, mm-hmm you're looking for integrity and you've got to figure out where your integrity is. And this is something I find really ex- like extremely great and, and prominent within everyone here. And Yana, I just, I sort of, when I first met you, it, there was a transmission of like, it was like, I knew you before I knew you, you know, a, a perception of you, but like that there was like a fierce integrity and masculine sitting there from my perception that as I slowly got to know you, I felt like the, the, the strongness, the, the backbone, the sword and, and your ability to feel emotions like the feminine side. And I'm just curious to, to hear what your thoughts are on that, that duality of feminine and masculine within women's work to be able to show up with a strong masculine and strong feminine. I think that the more we as women can understand how to hold ourselves, the deeper we can go. Mm. And I think that, you know, I I often look to how a woman can hold herself to assess how well she could hold me Mm -hmm. or hold something of mine. Mm. And so I think that, yeah, cultivating our masculine and feminine internally Mm. and, and really integrating the two and creating a relationship where the two can hold one another is huge Mm. like i've i've definitely really been thrown into that through my marriage Mm. you know like yen is on my husband coming into his feminine and then exploring his feminine and masculine and then me having to do the same as well and having to really like ignite my own masculine and and really like stalk where i was outsourcing that and where i was wanting to get that from him instead Mm. i think it's it's just it's brought me into this space where I have a responsibility and I have a duty to show up for what I'm speaking about and to Mm. to do it. And sometimes that's the only thing that holds me accountable. Like Mm. Yana, you're speaking about this. You have to show up to it. Mm. So sometimes it's talking and then walking, Mm. but like, I, I just don't feel good in my body if I'm speaking about something that I can't back. Mm. And so I, I have to do the work and I have to show up to that and, I think there's also another piece to it that I imagine we can all relate to is when we're holding a lot of space for a lot of emotion as practitioners, we have a responsibility to hold ourselves in a particular way and to understand containers, opening them, closing them really like that structure is vital in not just completely falling apart. Mm. We have to deliver right Mm. as people who are, who are guiding this work, we have to deliver on what we say we're going to deliver on. And I think that that's a, that's where we really need to, to lean into the masculine and, and show up and hold the secrets and keep our promise and do whatever it is that we need to do 
to to give the best of ourselves mm. and and so yeah i think that masculinity within women's work and also diving into the feminine the two initiate each other the deeper mm. we go into the emotions the more we're required to bring that spine that sword in and mm. the more we bring the spine in like the more we really bring ourselves back to the spine and, and activate that sword and activate the masculine the mm. deeper we can go into actually calling calling ourselves forward as much as we need to and then diving into the emotions that come with that mm. so yeah yeah vital like really really important 100 percent, 100 percent. i i that's you know these are the the women that i in, am inspired by the most and as a man like dating women it's just like it's i have to see how strong is your masculine because I also want to be held, you know, like I don't want to hold all the time. And if I need to feel safe with my own vulnerability and my own emotions with someone. So to see, you know, that being taught to women by people that I see with a, with a strong masculine is just like, I'm out there like, yes, thank you for, for, you know, creating more beautiful humans that can hold me as a male. And, you know, this is the, the polarity of, of men's and women's work of like, it's, it's somewhat I see, especially in the spiritual community, it's like somewhat even teaching the, like the opposites in a way. It's like from if it's like stereotyping uh, masculine and feminine is like, a lot of men are being taught how to feel their feelings and a lot of women are being taught how to like stand in their integrity and actually like keep clear movement towards the things that are most important for them. Um, and I guess like, I don't know lots about wild grace Sigourney, but from my perception, it looks like you're doing a lot of embodiment work and, and actually going into different emotional traumas and moving through them with emotional catharsis and embodiment, which I would, I guess, consider more of a feminine embodiment way of being. <laughs> if, if you're taking women into these experiences and really getting them into their fields and moving through things cathartically, how do you create the, like the pulling out of the vortex, you know, to go all the way in. And if everyone's in it and it's creating this massive whirlpool of emotion and though it's to move through the things, how do you stop it from continuing to spiral down? Yeah. So I guess like within our trainings, we actually work with some masculine archetypes as well. Cool. One of them being the warrior. Mm. Um, and we also look at the masculine fe feminine versions of each archetype through each chakra. Um, so, you know, like at the level of like if we're working with ether element, for example, we're working with priestess and priest mm. and, um, we've actually got, and priestess is actually, you know, we're working with the individual frequency of the archetype within the person because my priestess, for example, is extremely masculine. Mm. Um, and it's my space holder and it, it, it is having a really strong spine and backbone, um, being quite penetrative. Um, so we work a lot with both polarities within Wild Grace and we actually are bringing men into the space, into the next training, which is really beautiful as well. So, mm. yeah. yeah, I'm curious to hear like for that, bringing men into this space to create practitioners as someone that's been more predominantly working with women, what are like, what is, what are you most excited about, about having men in that space? And what are you currently feeling is going to be most challenging for yourself? Yeah. So it's actually interesting because predominantly my work has been with men. Um, not many people know about this, but I spent five years working purely with men. Mm. Um, one on one, I would see roughly three men a day. Mm. Um, and it's only been more recently in the past three years that I've started working more strongly with women. Um, and really my desire for working with women was really how deeply I feel for men. And, um, originally my, my connection to want to heal my dad's emotional wounds. Um, and then my desire to bring, um, relationships to get together in a more harmonious way. And so that's kind of where my work with women kind of stemmed from my <clears throat> desire for greater unity and relationships. Um, and so I'm really excited to bring men back into the space because I've experienced how profound it has been actually helping, um, like doing women's work for the past three years and how that's helped them to transform their relationships with men, even not having the men in the spaces. Um, 
and now to kind of circle back around and, and have the weaving t of the two together. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, it's a new edge for me, but um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm excited about it. I don't know how it's going to unfold. I'm actually a little bit nervous mm. about having mm. women and men in a space together. Mm. Um, but my desire is actually to take out the um, almost take out the sex completely and just see the souls in a space and, and mm -hmm. see, you know, um, the feminine in, in the man and the masculine in the woman and to, to try and work on more of that, um, mm -hmm. I guess, fluid space beyond um, the, the, the biology, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I ask what it is that you're specifically nervous about with having men around women? in that space or, or vice versa? Yeah, it's actually um, more the way that I space hold when there are men in the space, it changes the dynamics mm. of how I show up. And um, I was talking to actually my partner is going to be coming into um, the next training. And yeah, I think I'm going through a journey at the moment of really integrating my feminine and masculine, because when I'm in a space where it's, usually all women, I polarize more into more of a masculine kind of um, space holding energy. Mm. And when I've been working with men traditionally, um, I've been a bit more fluid, but I generally polarize into more of a feminine space. And this time it feels like, okay, there's equal men to women mm. and I'm bringing in and I'm actually coming from more of a balanced space. And that, that for me, it's just an internal change and, so it's more, more of an anxiousness around stepping into an unknown territory for me, mm. like an unknown space rather than actually having, you know, men and women in a space. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, it's a curiosity and a new exploration. So. Mm, mm. Awesome. Yeah, I'm curious to hear with Leah and, and Yana how that's played out because of, like you said, Leah, you've just recently started introducing men into your containers and Yana, I'm not too sure how specifically you'd be doing it, but I do know you and Yaniso do couples stuff and, and how that energy plays out with having a man in your container, a male identifying person. Um, if there is an energy change um, for whichever of you feel to answer first. Leah, you want to kick off? Sure. Um, so I think, you know, I, I'm quite masculine in how I do most things. I think my masculine energy drives my business, certainly. Um, and yeah, I think that I do show up in a very, especially when it comes to facilitating my containers, I show up in a very masculine way. Um, but the work that we do inside my containers is quite feminine in nature. Mm. And so it's, you know, it's very fluid and I'm completely intuitively driven. Mm. So I'm not a person that plans content. So, you know, once that there's the holding of the container that is quite masculine and then sort of the work that happens inside the container is quite feminine in nature. Mm. And mm. so I haven't actually found that that changes at all for me having men coming into my container. Um, I, you know, one of the things that I've noticed is that, that the way that I work can be quite challenging for men, mm. um, especially men that come in and want, okay, I want to know, you know, on this day, we're going to talk about this thing. And on mm. this day, we're going to do this thing. And that's, that's not how I work. So I show up and then whatever's coming through from the divine that day is what we work on. And certainly, you know, in my programs, my signature programs, there are certain, there are certain clearing things that we do and there are certain videos that they watch and, you know, there is some structure. Um, so I think that, that the only thing that I've really found that, that has been a little bit challenging for me is getting some pushback from men where they wanted more structure and then me having to ask myself, okay, is it in my highest and best good and in the highest and best good of this container to shift this? Mm. And ultimately that answer was no. And so yeah. one of the things that happens now when I'm bringing men into my containers is an explanation of this is more of an explanation, which I never have to do with women of, mm. Hey, this is how I work. 
So if mm. you come into this container, this is what you can expect from me. Mm. Um, and then there's the other piece of me that definitely shows up in the like really being able to show up and call people on their shit. And, and so I feel like there is an amazing mix of both masculine and feminine in my containers. Um, and I guess the, the long answer to the potentially short question is I don't, I don't, I have not changed how I'm showing up in my containers. Okay, cool. Awesome. I, I hear you on the structured thing. Um, when I, when I was running the record label and Alpha signed to us and I'm helping manage the stuff that she does, like she would rock up to shows and with no set list, you know, before she performed, she's like, well, I don't know what I'm going to perform. And I'm like, what do you mean? You can't just, I'm uh, like, because I had just like, I'd all been working with all male artists beforehand and like, and Nardine, who is quite actually very masculine in everything she does, you know, she's also very feminine, but she's, she's similar to yourself, Leah. And, and, Alpha would rock up with no structure to what she was doing. And I was, it was so hard for me to surrender to that. And I'd done one of your courses, Leo, and it was more of a, just an automated live thing. And I remember like, just like rocking up each time. And, and I think there was like a loose, like, this is what's going to happen. And you'd like talk about it for a moment. And you're like, yeah, I don't really want to talk about that. Here's what's really going on. And I'm like, surrender surrender to this no structure and like it taught me a lot like okay let go of structure because there's sometimes with courses for me especially the reason why i don't want to do them is because i have to create structure and i know once i just surrender to just doing what is right you know once i know what the transmission i'm actually trying to give across and just freestyling and and allowing it to be intuitive and guided I'm like, oh, you know, I can actually pump this out and feel way more easy about it, you know, rather than being so rigid and actually not being able to fit through the hole. I need to be a bit more fluid. So, yeah, I really, I really love that about yourself. I really relate to what Leah said. I, I feel similarly in that when I deliver, I deliver intuitively. And I, I think that's how I am as well just as a person I think that's a big part of how I show up I'm often described as a bit of a chameleon mm. I have so many different realities and different places in the world and different communities and you know even my accent like changes depending on where I am and I think that just like flowing with it is a big part of how I show up mm. I can definitely see how you know being married to Nyenizo who is deeply spiritual um, very connected to his ancestors, very much like calling energy of transformation in all the time. And also as viral practitioner, doing the work and diving deep, we're constantly both calling each other to face, to face off with the energies that are moving. And we've, we've really dived into, you know, initially it was like, oh, I need to initiate my masculine and him going, oh, he needs to initiate his feminine. And then suddenly we'd realize that, oh, actually like, we're not getting on because our masculines don't get on. And then like, you know, now we've cultivated, you know, we could never, ever, ever do business before. We'd sit down for a business <laughs> meeting and just fight. And now like we call each other mate and bro and we fist bump and it's like the brotherhood's there. And, you know, I did his makeup the other day. And so like, we're starting to journey into like both of our feminines and like really bringing the sisterhood into our marriage as well. Mm. And I feel like through journeying that at home, like it always starts at home for me, through journeying that at home, I'm able to see when I'm working with couples, mm. like whether this is like, you know, masculine, feminine, or it might be like, oh, okay, you guys are butting heads because like actually, you know, she's stepping into business and she's rising and suddenly there's a masculine, masculine clash or like, mm. and, and I really believe in like bringing the brotherhood and the sisterhood into those dynamics. So for me, it's just really feeling in the moment where someone is at and responding to that, but responding to that through the framework of like, is this brotherhood, is this sisterhood, is this masculine, feminine as a polarity, like how, what's being asked for and then speaking to that and, and guiding that and journeying that. Mm, mm. Yeah. Huge. And for someone that may be listening, that's like, of wanting to get into women's work, you know, like we're talking about feminine, masculine, these different archetypes of ourselves that could be quite overwhelming. What do you feel 
is like your first step. This is for everyone. We can popcorn style. Like what is the first step that you like to teach someone that's quite new to this work? Do you like to do it yourself? Do you like to guide it to someone else? Um, but like someone that is like new to spirituality and the concept of like sisterhood on this level and, and healing emotionally and cathartically and changing their mindsets around certain beliefs where does someone start? I can jump in on that one. Mm -hmm. I feel like the first place to start always, always, always is dropping into the body. Like for me, dropping into the body, being able to actually connect. I think for a lot of women, it, it, the curiosity begins with the womb Mm -hmm. and cycles. And I think a lot of like, feminine teachings are rooted in in like tracking your cycle knowing your moon cycle connecting with the womb like a lot of sisterhood language sparks from that space Mm. so it could be that it's like dropping into womb space and really starting to journey your cycles in that sense but even before that Mm. just learning to connect with the body learning to like drop out of the head and Mm. into that intuitive more fluid space Mm. is always Mm the place to begin and I think that as a task like if someone listening just wants the first Mm. task for me it's breath it's just Mm. like bringing your hands to your body taking a deep breath in and using the exhale to sink inside Mm. and just like just inhaling and using the exhale to like drop inside of yourself Mm. and the deeper that you can go the more of your own answers you'll find and that's where that's where the intuition arises and that's where it's like oh like my body has been speaking to me the whole time. My intuition has been there the whole time. I just couldn't understand it. I couldn't mm. translate it. I didn't realize that that's what it was saying. You know, mm. that was definitely my experience. And I've seen that in a lot of other women as well. It's like, this has always been there. Oh, it was, it was speaking to me. Mm. So yeah, dropping, dropping in through the body, I feel is, is the first place to begin. Awesome. Sigs, I feel like you have something to say. Yeah, I was just going to say, I totally agree with that. And then, and then from that space, guiding them to know what, what's next. Mm. Um, so actually taking them on a journey to be like, what, what do you feel? Like, where, where are you feeling pulled? Mm. But you can only have that once the, the initial layers are dropped and you can actually feel and hear that voice. And then you can guide them to, to know what it is that they need. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. That I, that's, and that's, I feel like, such a difficult one for a lot of humans is like, or what is it, you know, like, what am I drawn to? And I think this is really cool with all of us being spiral practitioners, like, and just practitioners of lots of different modalities, including our own is like, I believe you have to look at who you're drawn to. If they're starting to ask Sigs or if they're starting to ask Leo, starting to ask Yana is like, well, obviously there's something of, of yourself. So you sort of have to like unpack what it is that they're drawn to you about i believe you know i'm curious for you leah for someone that's all of a sudden wanting to go on this this wealth journey and starting to repattern themselves where would they start you know if they're like fuck i need to actually condition myself into understanding that i do deserve abundance well i think for me i mean it's, it's an interesting piece because i I feel that most people are really out of integrity with really understanding and knowing where their own energy is. Mm. Um, Women, especially because we constantly put our energy out to take Mm. care of our significant others or our partners or our children. And so, you know, 30 minutes after we've woken up, we've put our energy in 10 different places and people that haven't done spiritual work or that are just starting this journey. What I find is like just that, intentionally pulling back their energy into self Mm. is such a powerful practice because Mm. often we're like, Oh, I'm empathic and I can feel, you know, what other people are feeling or I'm sensitive and I'm sensitive to the energies that are happening around me. But rarely do people ask themselves, how do I feel right now? How does Mm. my energy feel? Like when I pull my energy back inside my own vessel, inside my own auric field, inside my own container, how do I feel? Mm. So that's, Like, I feel like that's really important in any work that you're doing, 
Mm. Um, and my thing with the wealth work is, you know, it's, are you willing to show up and question every single thing that you've been told about money, wealth and receiving? Um, and so it's that idea of questioning everything and consistently asking yourself, if this was a lie, if somebody was lying to me about this thing, why would they be lying to me and who would be benefiting? Because Uh, it is, you have to deconstruct the programming to be able to step into that place of deconstructing financial slavery consciousness, and then ultimately finding your own freedom inside inside of that. Um, you know, everybody wants, everyone wants financial freedom. Everybody wants economic freedom. Um, but that freedom comes through deconstructing the programming that's Mm. there. That's how we actually become free. Mm. Huge. Yeah. Money consciousness and and the slavery and just asking altogether, you know, like who, like if someone's lying to you, like why, you know, that's, there's like that applies to so many areas. I'm everywhere Everything. at the moment. Yeah. I'm, I mean, yeah. I, I'm like, where do I take this conversation with that? But, <laughs> but there's, there's two places I want to talk about. Um, I think first just while we're on that topic of people beginning is like sharing your beginning, like what actually what, what if there was a spot that goes, ah, oh, like I need to, I need to start looking at these, these possible lies and these parts of me that feel not complete or wounded and I don't know how to fix it. And, but I know there's a path. I'm curious to hear where each person sort of began that, that bit that dropped in and I might pass to you, Yana first, cause I see you nodding along with this one. I am. Um, I definitely recall like one of the key moments that initiated me and brought me into women's work. I was, I was running a bath. I was at home. Yenizo was on set at work. And I was, I I decided I wanted to drop film and photography and move into my art more. Mm. And I just, you know, I was, I was in this in between space and I was like, Oh, I'm in South Africa in this apartment. What am I, I'm here because I'm my man's woman. What does it mean to be my man's woman? Was wait, what does that even mean? Wait, what does it even mean to be a woman? Like, Mm. what is that? Mm. So already I was starting to question. I'd run this bath and I was on my moon and the phone rang and I went to go and get the phone, took the phone call quick, came back to the bath lifted my leg to step into the bath and saw that there was red on my thigh, just saw blood on my thigh. Mm. And my immediate, irrespo- my Im- immediate response was like, Ugh! and uh. I caught myself. It was almost as though like everything froze in that moment. Mm. And God came down and just like slapped me. <laughs> like the goddess, whoever just came down and slapped me. And there was just this like, oh my, like, wait, why am I thinking that something that is integral to me being a woman is disgusting? Like, where does that even come from? Mm. And that opened all of the questions and took me into like reading all of the books. And at the time I was super masculine. I was really like, you know, I was just really in my head about everything and wanted to understand the steps and the practicalities. And so I would like read a whole book and then I'd find the one line and I'd be like, ah, that's the gold. Okay, got it. And then I'd read another book and I'd be like, this is all nonsense. How do I apply any of this? Oh, okay, cool. I get it. And I slowly found my way into being able to apply the information and the wisdom that I was receiving Mm. rather than just like, oh, this is lovely and it's poetic and it's sweet and it's nice, but what does it actually do for my life? Mm. So It was just my incessant questioning, like, wait, where did this come from? How did we get here? Why do I think this? Who taught me this? Like, what? And just like pulling all of that apart and pulling myself apart at the same time. That Mm. was, that was like the moment for me though, when it clicked. Do you label that like when, when we start questioning everything, the, the spiritual awakening, is that because I guess for me, when I had my spiritual awakening was like, everything i just had to question everything do you is that what you would label that moment or what would you if you were to label that moment what would you call that for yourself i mean i just think of it as a moment i think that Mm -hmm. i think that for me the awakening is like always ongoing like i'm still in the awakening now Mm -hmm. like 
the, the, the awakening started at some point and then it's almost like there's always been little moments of awakening. And so the awakening for me is like an, an ongoing unfolding process of like, Oh my God, and, oh, this thing. And, Whoa. And like that has never stopped. And I'm not sure really where that started. So yeah, okay. for me, it's, it's definitely a moment of the awakening, but yeah. more of a pillar yeah. than the exact thing. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And just for anyone that's listening, do you, do you remember any of those books that you started off with that is a, a recommendation that you would give? I definitely feel like two books that are really great for this, like, how do I practically apply it piece? Mm. Mm. Uh, Wild Feminine by Tammy Lynn Kent and Vagina by Naomi Wolf. I feel mm. like those two provide a lot of insights into kind of the the logical or the scientific or the practical approach like if you want the steps to to move into this space mm, mm. um those are the two books that i often recommend as places to begin mm, beautiful thank you six you. would you like to share your journey in yeah i would just i guess add to that because that was really beautiful and and hearing yana and like it always for me begins with a question mm. and it always begins with admitting that I don't know something. And mm. then that creates the space for something known to come to me mm. and to land. And that's, I guess how my journey started was just being humble to the mystery and being like, I am in a space where I don't know. And then mm. I would go into prayer and I'd ask and be like, I like, I need, I need an answer. Or that's how my journey first began is I actually had, um, a complete mental, spiritual, physical breakdown. Um, at the time I was working as a senior diagnostics in, in neuro department in hospitals, major hospitals, diagnosing people with neurological disorders. And um, then I actually started developing a neurological disorder myself from deep stress. Um, and one day I, I had no background. I had no um, mentors. There was no part of me that was spiritually aligned at that point um, that I know it, knew about consciously. Um, and I just was in the bath and I just went into prayer and I just intuitively knew I had to, had to pray. And in that moment is when my um, gifts as a seer opened up and I started to see myself in living in India and in Nepal and studying monasteries and ashrams and um, then I just asked, I said, what's my next, what do I need to know now? Mm. And a week later on Facebook, a Facebook post popped up about um, a woman that was living in a monastery. And so I just bought my ticket and went and lived and studied over in Nepal. And I guess my whole journey has been that it's about being, getting to a point where I feel like I'm like, Oh, I, I can't, there's something stuck. There's something, the doors aren't opening. Like I'm not really sure where to go. And then I sit back and that's when I'm like, you know, I either usually go through an emotional process or something's breaking down and something's realigning and I sit back and then I ask and then that's when something new opens and a new path reopens. So that's definitely like I would say a fundamental piece to it is is being humble enough to to say that I, I actually don't know in this situation I need help and mm, and mm. being open to what arises from that space. Mm, mm. Huge, yeah. So it's that continued questioning is what i'm hearing again and yeah cool that you knew to like pray in the bath you know i could i just can't imagine a moment <laughs> for me before spirituality was a thing in my life where i'd be like praying I, especially yeah, because I'm, I'm i'm painting it like this i'm sure you weren't in the bath like no i actually was though and oh is, yes amazing this is the thing. it's like i was not religious like my parents were atheists and actually i was brought up to question and i i would get kicked out of religious class constantly because i was always as a child, I was always questioning. I was actually in trouble all of the time. Mm. Even in music class, I was never allowed to play instruments. I had to sit in the corner, facing the corner, playing the triangle oh. um, because I would always question and teachers didn't like it. Mm. Um, but it was always just innate in me. And yeah, even though I wasn't religious, even though prayer wasn't something that was endogenous to me, um, in that moment, I just, it was just like my hands just came together. It was like, I just knew I had to pray. <laughs> they became magnets. So we're just like, listen yeah, to you. It was like You're that. fucking praying. <laughs> um, and it was totally foreign to me, but that's what opened me. So. Wow. Huge. Yeah. 
Mm. And Leia. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I'm like, okay, so what do I, do I talk about how I had a, my spiritual awakening or do I talk about the wealth stuff? And, and so I think I'll just, I'll share about um, how I had the awakening around the wealth stuff. Um, and I think that, you know, it had a lot to do with, I was raised by a single mother and I just had this experience my entire life of money controlling people mm. and like growing up and seeing that, like, and having that belief of like, we are powerless over, um, our governments and our, um, institutions and that money is really this thing that controls us. Um, and that can make people either so ridiculously happy or so depressed. And, mm. and that, so I grew up with that and I always wanted money. Like I wanted money because I wanted to be happy and I started working as soon as I could and had, you know, many different lifetimes during this lifetime of epic careers. Um, and I always just, money was always making, making money was always easy to me. Um, but I had this idea of, you know, what I wanted and it was this absolute programmed idea of to be a successful woman. I had to, you know, have my own business, have employees, have a ridiculously expensive house on the hill, have us drive a certain type of car. My kids needed to be in private school. Like I had all of these ideas of what would make me successful. Um, and I achieved all of those things and I was miserable mm. and so and you know this I guess it did actually coincide with my spiritual reawakening <laughs> um, but in that misery and in that desire to find something more mm. that's when my spiritual reawakening happened and I literally at one point called Kali in and I destroyed my businesses like mm. they imploded within about six months of, of doing Itch. that and we lost uh we lost the businesses we lost three million dollars we ended up a million dollars in debt we lost a house we lost a car um and literally like my life was decimated everything that had i that i had been programmed to believe was what made me successful and in those moments i questioned everything i questioned that programming i questioned what does success truly mean? I questioned, you know, and ultimately what I came to was success is happiness. Uh, uh. And, and I also realized that it was, that it was the control uh. and the oppression that created lack of freedom. And what I really desired and the thing that was going to make me feel happy was freedom. Uh. And then I started making associations with money actually being neutral, not being good or bad, and it being an ally and a resource to use for freedom. Mm. 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 Yeah, massive. And like a huge thing that also outside of the questioning that I've heard ties everyone together is like more so Sigs and Leah here. And Leah, it sounds like on a societal way, the biggest of like, there's got to be destruction, you know, there's got to be a pain, you know? And like, for instance, like mm -hmm. Yana's yours was more of a, like a pain of yourself, you know, it was like pain of being woman. Mm -hmm. Sig's yours was like a more of a mental pain. And then Leah, yours was more of a like financial pain. And I'm, and this is something that I'm so curious about, like women's work, men's work, spiritual work, emotional work, mental work, whatever it is, is like, I feel like there's like something that's planted there that means growth means hard means pain you know and Leah a big one that started off a bit of this like etymology for me was was you talking about being humble you know and and like that actually meaning to make yourself feel like you're less than someone else or I can't remember the exact saying but it's the saying like someone's better than you you know essentially and one that's huge in our community is the word vulnerable. And when I look at that word and the actual definition is to be open to being emotionally or physically hurt. And I feel like it's used way more often than it's meant to be. Like an example is, is like the queer community, people of color, any minorities, they're in a vulnerable position. When I went to the protests on the weekend, 
it was vulnerable because of it was illegal and there was cops and they were, you know, harassing people. But for me to, it's like, be vulnerable, feel your feelings. It's like, I don't know if that's correct, you know, to go, Hey, be open to being hurt. And I'm, I'm just, and, and I think another part that plays into it is this, we start questioning everything and I don't know about you guys, but I, getting stuck in a vortex sometimes of questioning too much, you know, I'm, I'm stuck and I'm like, how can I be better? Or why isn't this working? And should I be doing it this way? Should I be doing it that way? And it's actually stunting my growth and creating that pain as well. And, and a lot of it is like, be vulnerable to get out of all the questions, you know, and it's like, have we created this, this, this like, loop of of like a feedback loop of pain growth pain growth and and how do we Mm. for anyone that's following us how do we teach to not make personal development hard and painful i don't have an answer for this but i'm just wondering Mm. if anyone here maybe has some tips on that what you've learned along the way especially for women i'd love to take this one first Mm. Um, you know, I, yeah, absolutely. As a spiritual community, we are committed to fucking struggle. Like (laughs) we will ride that struggle bus until the wheels come off. Mm -hmm. And because we wear it like a badge of honor, it's Mm. like, look how much I've struggled that directly equals how spiritual I am. And we are rewarded (laughs) and we get a payoff for that Mm. within our communities. Mm. And so, you know, Yes, I absolutely believe that on the other side of any type of constriction, there Mm. is expansion. Like those are the universal laws, right? Mm. We constrict Mm. and then we expand. Mm. Um, But as spiritual people, especially people that, you know, are doing significant transformative processes, we can get addicted to that need to constrict to to expand and so i think you know one of the things that i teach a lot or that i talk about a lot is it doesn't always have to be that Mm. and yes those moments are hugely beneficial when we have them but just because you don't have that experience of that complete decimation or the constriction doesn't mean you're not expanding Mm. and that you know if we would come down off our crosses already and leave our martyrdom complexes behind Mm. and really again it's this tap into our own energy and how we're feeling and allow ourselves to to show up for ourselves instead of having to constantly be seeking something outside of ourselves I mean I think that's a lot of the issue that we get into and even with vulnerability why are we being vulnerable you know why do we do the vulnerable share because we want validation externally Mm. right so Mm. if we come back to self and check in with self and our own energy and it's like okay how am i feeling what do i need in this moment Mm. and use that as our barometer and that as our gauge and not the external validation and not the programming around what spiritual is or what we need to do or be to be spiritual Mm. um i think you know i see a lot of my clients and i certainly like I'm constantly looking for like where I'm going is how to expand from an easier and easier place. Like, I don't want to be in the decimation anymore. Like I'm over it, you know, Mm -hmm. and I welcome it when it comes because I know what's on the other side of it. But the Mm -hmm. practice and the work for me right now is achieving that expansion without decimation. Uh Uh Dude. Yes, I'm a fuck yes for that. Preach, Leah. Yeah. Oh, yes, preach. Sometimes that can be more challenging, actually, as well. Um, it can be more challenging yeah. to move towards ease. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> like that. That's especially my for those of us that do it so well, right? Like yeah. when we do when we do the struggle and the decimation so well, it's that is the work. That is. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, well, that was like, we did it like me and a bunch of friends, we did a like a New Year's ritual and like set intentions in mind was no ego deaths this year, no having to like <laughs> die and destroy everything to expand because I do it, you know, yearly on tap and and there's a specific, a specific time that it happens and it happens around um, 
March, April, May, and I survived everybody. <laughs> I didn't, didn't do it. <laughs> so I think I'm in the clear. I still don't know. And if I'm honest, I haven't been doing much personal development. I've been like sticking away a bit from it. I've been like, I'm good enough just to now, you know? And I think that's a big part of it too, saying like, I am whole. I do love myself. I am good enough. But yeah, just for the moment, I'm like very tentative towards like people are like, hey, you want to come into this program? I'm like, ah, oh, no, like <laughs> I'm, I'm anti life destruction at the moment. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that validation of, of putting up vulnerable posts, like that's, that's a part of my brand, you know, I'm, I'm really good at that. And, and I think it's, I guess, a curious thing. I just want to stick with you for the moment, Leah, and anyone else that wants to tap in on it, but just because Leah's really shared about this is um, I think a part of it is because we're spiritual entrepreneurs and, and playing that, that vulnerability game is most engaging. I believe is like, cause of we're brought up on soap operas and drama from school and whatnot, that this is what gets people most elated. But if I'm like, just like giving the facts of the course or what's going on in my life and prices and sales and marketing. It's not, it's people will see it. They're great. But sometimes I believe what works best is a vulnerable post, but then it plays into this, like, because of sometimes I know for myself, like, sometimes I cr- I've like pushed myself to a new vulnerable edge just to get engagement, which is horrible to say, but it's the truth, you know, like it's like, what can, what is, where can I really expose myself? That's going to really bring down some walls for some engagement for my Instagram. I feel like the word vulnerable is something that I journeyed in a big way because people kept like telling me, that I was being vulnerable. And I never thought, I I never felt vulnerable. If I'm vulnerable, I'm not crafting a well-worded post on Facebook. Like that's not, that's not like, if I'm vulnerable, I'm probably like huddled up in a corner with blankets, (laughs) like breathing, crying, trying to move whatever it is I'm moving or like all my defense mechanisms are up. So I think this like um, voluntary thing around vulnerability is, I, I don't know, I was, I was being open. That's how I would say, like, I, I was, I was being open, yeah. probably more open than most people are. Mm-hmm. And then people would write to me saying, oh, you're so vulnerable. <laughs> and I'd be like, I'm not fucking vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. What? what? <laughs> so openness is the word that I like to use in place mm. of vulnerability in, in the way that the community uses it. Mm. And mm. I find that that keeps me out of that, like, mm. struggle, victim, emotional, mm. problematic kind of mindset yeah it's definitely how i how i journey it i love that you brought this in yeah i I done one the other day with a a bunch of men on men's work and we we chose to because we're talking about like for me before fully getting into this community if if a woman to me my partner's like why can't you be vulnerable i'd feel like i'm being attacked you know like it's like and i think it's got something to do with that of what it actually means you know the etymology of vulnerability but we chose the word within the community what it means is just be honest you know and open also works you know and i can relate to that like when i put a quote unquote vulnerable post up people are like oh my god you know that's so courageous of you you must have you know as a big vulnerability and sometimes i do that like because i do my posts over voice message that convert to text and i'll be like eating breakfast and i'm like and then I did this and I did that. And it's actually not that vulnerable. Like you're saying, vulnerable for me is like, yeah, being eating corn chips and crying and listening to Frank Ocean or something like that, you know? <laughs> 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 yeah, but I, I think what I was also, I guess, specifically saying in that as well, why I was directing that at you, Leah, was I think you you do really well at just getting sales posts out there and making them engaging, you know, and like being able to market yourself without even really having to do the open thing or the, the vulnerable thing or whatever it is that we want to call it all the time. You know, like I see a lot more is like, your thing is just like, do the thing, you know, like <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to like one 
do you come up against that? Like, fuck, I do need to be more vulnerable to be, to get more engagement or are you just like fully certain and know these posts work for you and, and how did you get there? Um, you know, I think that, I mean, again, it's this, it, it absolutely is the deconstructing of the programming, right? Mm-hmm. Because one of the things that I noticed really early on in the coaching business and certainly in the online space is there were these formulas for doing things and these ways that people got engagement and these ways that people got sales. And one of the things that just really disgusted me early on was like, ah, everybody wants to hear the survivor story. Mm-hmm. Everybody want, wants to, they want to know, you know, they want to know my story about the decimation of my business, right? They want to root for the underdog. They want to be like, oh, look, she came, you know, she had a million dollars in debt and look where she is now. Uh, um, uh, uh. and I, I recognized really early on, especially when I started deconstructing programming around financial slavery consciousness, that those, that actually doesn't serve us, uh. um, continuing to revisit our past traumas of how we, you know, made it out. Like uh. it doesn't serve us. And yes, it's something that happened and, and is a part of, of my history. And it's, it's something that if it weren't for that, I wouldn't be where I am today. Mm. Um, but I tend to not go into those types of stories because I'm more interested in people looking at and taking self-responsibility and accountability for where they are now in this moment, right? And then looking at how can I action getting from this place to the place that I desire to be, which is why the majority of my posts you'll see are about where are you right now? And is that where you desire to be? Mm. And if not, where do you desire to be? And here I have a solution for you to get from here to there Mm. instead of, you know, going into that personal stuff. And I think that, you know, I mean, there's certainly dozens of videos on the interwebs. I think that you can find about my struggles and what I've been through in my life, (laughs) but it at this point, it's like, is it, it's not, it's not really that relevant. And it certainly isn't relevant to, to me being able to help people deconstruct Mm. their programming. Like, Mm. yes, I've done it for myself and that's great. And you know, yeah, it's a part of my story, Mm. but ultimately it's, are you ready and willing to question everything? Are you ready and willing to look at everything differently? And if you are, then let's just do the fucking thing. Right. Mm. Mm. Like we don't. And so, and, and that I do find works for me. And, you know, and sometimes if I have something to share that's, I mean, certainly while all this stuff has been happening in the world, you've seen me show up much more vulnerably on my social media. You know, mm-hmm. I've talked about my personal experience as a multiracial woman. I've been sharing some of that stuff. You've seen posts and, and live streams go out about that stuff because I have something to say right now that I believe is relevant Mm. and it's not to me just noise or an attempt at, at getting a sale or engagement, if that makes sense. And so Uh I think, um, I just, I've found a way that won't for me to do it. And, Mm. you know, I, I'm not saying that people shouldn't go do the vulnerable post because Uh people love it. And, Uh and it is, I do think that, um, when we show up in vulnerability or in openness or in truth telling or whatever you want to call it, Mm. that is how people resonate with us, right? Mm. It Mm. is through those connections of our, our vulnerability and our honesty and our truth telling that, that they relate to us. And Mm. I guess for me, I'm just in a place where I believe that people can find resonance with me in that energetically I have their best interest at heart and I'm trying to help them deconstruct their financial slavery consciousness. And they mm-hmm. don't really need to know about, <laughs> you know, Sean giving plasma to pay for diapers and formula at one point in our lives to resonate mm-hmm. with me in that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I think that's like, that's important to know, like, that you can go into like you know you welcome everything exactly but you're finding places where it's actually relevant and rather than just doing it for engagement or doing it to whatever whatever you want to call it everyone has different reasons for doing it and i think a big part of it plays into is like trying to create content because we're we're all having 
or choosing to be content factories to an extent, you know, to get products out there to keep engaging people in the forefront of like seeing us as the brand and getting to know us and our story. And like SIGs, I look at your social media sometimes and you have like some days you do like three posts in one day. I'm like, Ooh, like that's a lot. And I'm curious to know with, managing a business, managing personal development, normal life, creating brands, m- mentoring other people, et cetera, and, and getting all this content out. How are you keeping like a healthy relationship with social media? Yeah, thanks for asking. I just want to add to something that Leah just said before, and it's definitely mm-hmm. around the uh, subjective um, perception of the word vulnerability because mm. to me I would see what you're doing as being more vulnerable mm. because often what I actually see is what people are describing as vulnerability is actually victim loops and emotional trauma mm. and actually the real vulnerability is stepping into that space of, of okay I'm ready to move beyond this and into actually owning like what I do need to do to change and actually when we step into that new territory that's actually more vulnerable and often we will stay in these unhealthy vulnerable loops to actually stop ourselves from being vulnerable because at that in that space where you're actually pioneering and you're stepping into the unknown that's actually true vulnerability Uh, um it's uh, scary it's uh, really scary uh, and a lot of people will stay in these these unhealthy victim loops to actually stop themselves from stepping into that space uh, so i would actually say that's extremely vulnerable um and yeah i guess for me like writing and sharing content is like breathing for me um, if you know astrology, I have a stellium of Scorpion, uh, Scorpio in the third house, the house of communication. Mm. And so for me, it's like words just flow through me as is fully as like me walking or breathing. It's like, mm. I, I don't think it's just like sh- the words just come through. And so, um, actually it's more painful for me to not show up and write. I find mm. it's like, if I'm blocking that channel, then actually that's when I start to feel a lot of creative tension in my body and start to feel anxious. Mm. Um, so it's quite easy for me to show up in that, in that way and in that space. What I've had to learn and what I've been in a massive journey on the past few years um, with a sudden return in Capricorn in the sixth house <laughs> and building out a legacy and a, um, a business um, and now with a team of close to 20 people behind me um and two companies i have had to learn how to draw some really strong boundaries in my life and only do what it is that i am best at and outsource and um i'm constantly learning how to do that better Mm. and Mm. how to trust people to come in and do the things that i know i do well but is not where i need to be Mm. um and so for me, the past few years has been just a huge journey of trust mm. Um, mm. and letting go and, and, and just being, just showing up for, for what it is that I love, which is communicating and writing and writing my books and the mentoring work. So, mm. Yeah. Like that, I think that's also a vulnerable thing. Like you're like praising Leah for that step up. I think the step up of bringing on team, you know, is, is a very vulnerable part and like (laughs) still, still something I'm, I'm working with. I get a few people on and then I'm like, no, 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 I want to do everything on my own. You can't do it as good as me or blah. And then, (laughs) and then I burn out again and I'm like, Oh, I get a few people on. And then it's just this pattern of like, can I truly relinquish, you know, and go, no, I trust. Or even, you know, is it a is it a pattern of me purposely choosing people that aren't good at that job, um, mm-hmm. so I can go, I oh, know you're not as good, you know. And and I think that comes ties into the also the money consciousness stuff because I believe a lot in our community and I've done myself is exchange work as well. So you're like just trying to fish out who mm-hmm. will actually exchange for this rather than. Um, then who's actually good at this and I'll pay you to do it, you know, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is. Yeah. And when you actually make that decision, it's like, (laughs) then everything shifts to meet you there. And then like the, the, the finances come in and then you can actually step up to that level. That's what Mm -hmm. I found too. It's, it's um, been a huge journey of trust of learning to 
know that when I invest actually more, it's like, that's, that's actually the point of growth at which like, mm. you know, the, the money that does want to flow through to me can actually support me and feed back into my team because I've actually trusted in, mm. in making that decision. So, mm. Mm. so. It, yeah, that brings me back to the thing of, um, hurting ourselves for growth i think a substitute where i'm okay with it is if the money is all right you know it's that exchange of of, i guess money stability and happiness and sometimes i'll throw myself in a deep end it's like i don't know how i'm gonna pay you but i'm gonna do it anyways and then there's a struggle to to figure it out you know but i guess i the payoff is the money not only the emotional work i think that's more the journey i'm on and moving through to not have to be in pain for money and throwing myself in the deep end this isn't really a question it's just a share and and i'm wondering if anyone you know i guess one resonates with that and has found their solutions to throwing yourself in the deep end to level up your business within this women's work that you're doing yeah i mean i'll speak to that because i i definitely Mm. like did this to myself a few years back Mm. yeah year, a year and a half ago, I guess, like, that was absolutely my pattern. It was like, when I would stretch myself in my investments, I always would make more money. Mm. And I also had patterns of ability to manifest large amounts of money under stress and duress. Mm -hmm. And it was a pattern that I've carried my whole entire life. Mm. And so I, every time I would enter into these like coach mentor relationships, and then would have this financial expansion on the other side of it I just was like ah this is what this is what I'm supposed to do Mm. and then somewhere along the line I started recognizing and realizing that I didn't want to manifest under stress and duress anymore Mm. that I wanted to be a have a healthier relationship (coughs) excuse me with manifestation and Mm. I realized how much this throwing myself in the deep end thing was contributing to Mm. my unhealthy manifestation Mm. um and so now for me, like I've moved into this really beautiful place where it's like investments get to be made with grace and ease. Mm -hmm. And if I desire something, there's always like, I'm, I'm now practicing, you know, my, my daily practice now is living in states of overflow. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of that, anything that I desire to invest in, I have the ability to, because I'm constantly living in a state of overflow. I don't have to enter into, I don't have to put myself in that constriction in order to have the expansion. I can simply choose that that is someone that is aligned with me that I desire to work with. And regardless of how much money it is, I know that I am constantly living in a state of overflow. So it's going to be there and be available to me. Mm. Um, Mm. And so now, you know, how I work with myself in expanding my you know, that, that hit I used to get from throw yourself in the deep end, make sure you can swim. Now you get, you know, now you get the reward of financial expansion on the other side of it is working now on my value of my time, Mm. the monetary, the energetic, the monetary value of my time. And so instead of expanding myself in that way, I now expand myself in, Hmm, doesn't feel good for me to work for anything under this amount of money. Uh And now I'm going to hold myself to that place and I'm going to have that boundary with myself and I'm going to trust that that is what I'm deserving of. And I'm going to allow the universe to come and meet me there Uh with what I'm desiring to, um, with that energetic exchange for my time. Uh And so that's, that's what I'm journeying, journeying now. And that's what I've been journeying with my financial expansion. And let me tell you something, it's a lot more uh, unsettling and it's a lot harder than any time I threw myself in the deep end trying to make a big thing. What I was going to say though, was really interesting. I made a huge stretch of an investment into a coach as I was starting to journey this and I fell flat on my face. Uh, I didn't have the expansion. The money didn't show up. And it was uh, like, that was the knowing that it was like, you already knew. That, that it was time for you to move on from this. Uh, like if you already knew that like this wasn't for you. Uh, so, you know, so now for the last, I guess maybe two years now, like two and a half, 18 months, two years, like that's really what I've been journeying. And, and it's quite hard. It's quite difficult. And it's been really, really rewarding. And um, 
you know, it's always a journey. Like it just continues to be a journey. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ah, yes. We're all on a journey consistently. And it's, I guess it's so validating to hear like other people that I look up to among you three. It, we're all just on this same journey and we're still facing these same things. And yeah, we're popping through at different spaces, but just to be able to relate on that level. And I hope, you know, that gets across to anyone that listens is like, yeah, we're all on this journey. We help and we, we help ourselves and we, and you know, people crash and we crash ourselves. So, and we strive and we help other people strive, which is just really what's important for these conversations and the understanding around it for me to share our, our wisdom. And I guess that draws me to some, maybe the last question is, what do you feel with women's work where it begins or all the way to where you're up to now, maybe two or three of like the core wounds that drive this work and that need healing um, for anyone that is listening and, and still maybe isn't at that questioning thing to be like, oh, yeah, I do want to question these two or three things for myself and, and that they can just sit and, and gnaw on that for a moment. I feel like there's a sisterhood piece that's really big, a desire for community among women. And I think a lot of us as women have, you know, playground stories of the girls that didn't include us or like all the kind of mean gossip bitchiness of us developing our social skills. I think a lot of that happened girl to girl. And so there's a lot of woman to woman community do do you really accept me do I really fit in can I trust you so I think sisterhood is a big one Mm. um Mm. and then I would say that the other one is like how in my body am I um Mm. I think a lot of us are familiar as women with having like really bad menstrual cramps or feeling disconnected from our body or not being able to like really inhabit ourselves sexually or sensually or intuitively, whatever it is that that we're journeying in relation to the body, even body image being such a big thing. I think full reclamation of of our bodies in every sense is another really big one and really Mm. coming to love the body and speak to the body and have an intimate connection with our bodies and everything that can come through them. So I would say those, those are the two key pieces, anything embodiment and body related and anything Mm. sisterhood and women. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, Just to expand on the the sisterhood piece would be, um, I have a lot of people come to me wanting to work with me because they're, um, they pedestal me or they, they think I've got something that um, is they don't have or is unattainable. And that's actually a very good reason to come into these spaces and, and work with someone. Because if we're, if we're recognizing something, then there's something within us that um, is dormant and waiting to be activated. And that's a very good reason to want to move towards that. Mm. Um, mm. And the other thing I would say is just the, the belief of having to do it alone. Mm. Going back to the community piece again as well of um, actually allowing support in and allowing yourself to be supported by a community and allowing that to leverage you um, towards what it is you're desiring. So, mm. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. For me, I think it's this piece around like the worthiness and deserving. And in so many ways as little girls, when we're growing up, Um, there still is, and still now there is so much oppression Mm. and don't be too big. Don't be too emotional. Don't, you know, stay in your place. Um, be smaller than you are. And what that does is just imprint this belief that we're not as worthy and deserving as our male counterparts. Mm. And so as a result, we're willing to accept less pay. We're willing to you know, not believe that we are worthy and deserving of all the financial abundance and, and uh, abundance otherwise, right? Like Mm -hmm. all types of wealth um, Mm -hmm. in our lives. And so 
um, it's that, you know, when we have that question of like, am I worthy of this? Am I deserving of this? Um, and certainly if we're questioning, is there something more? Like, isn't there something better? Can't it be better? Mm. It's yes, it can. And yes, you are worthy. And yes, you are deserving. And it's unpacking that and deconstructing that mm. that gets us to that place where, where I believe we can start to step into like what a truly empowered woman looks like. But mm. as long as we don't believe we're worthy or we're deserving of the things that, you know, our, our divine birthright as beings on this planet is really hard to be in that place. And mm. I think it's really hard for us to interact with each other because it doesn't matter how beautiful a sister is that comes and meet you, meets you when you don't feel worthy and you don't feel deserving of that. It's really difficult to be accepting of it. Mm. Mm. <laughs> uh, yes. I hope that that all these connect with, at least one person that I know or connect with many, many, many people. And it's such an important message. And I'm like super grateful to have an in for myself, you know, to what goes on in, in women's work and, and within just women altogether who are very similar and very different. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate you coming on and having this conversation with me just individually as my person. Like I'm, I'm really grateful because I look up to all three of you and as a man, you know, to come and talk to a man about what the inner worlds of, of women's work is because, you know, this, uh, I believe the, the biggest part is to create more unity within us all. So to give me the, the, the in to, to have these conversations, I, I am deeply appreciative of it. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for facilitating this. It was beautiful. I learned so much as well. So, and it's always amazing to share space with all of you. But I mm. love the conversation and the dialogue. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Wow. Yeah, grateful for the invite. Grateful for the conversation. Thank mm. you, everyone here, and thank mm. you, Paisley, for yeah, facilitating mm. this. Curious. Amazing. Thank you. Fair. Fair. She followed him and soon found herself falling in a very deep hole into a strange place called Curious Conversation. Curious Conversation. Nowadays, there are still girls and boys whose curiosity leads them to strange places.